Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, my name is Fred Larson. I am the president of the National Institute of Social Sciences, and I'd like to welcome you all for our current webinar, What's Next for Opera? Uh, we have a wonderful show here today, and uh, I will move quickly through the introduction so we can straight, get straight into it. But I do want to give you a few logistics as we go forward. All of the audience attendees are on mute by default. Mm -hmm. Uh, only the panelists and moderator will speak. Um, we can promote you to a panelist if we, uh, uh, if there's a particular reason, but generally we don't do that. Um, if you have questions for the moderator or the panelists, please use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom window to submit those. We will collate them and direct them to Mark uh, so he can send them to the panelists. We are recording this forum. Um, and we will share the link to the edit video after the event concludes, usually a few days afterwards. So please feel free to look for that if you have to, or you're not able to make it, or you'd like to send it to any friends or colleagues. Uh, this forum is being sponsored by the National Institute of Social Sciences. We are a congressionally chartered not-for-profit association. Uh, improve our world through the study and discussion of vital societal issues. Uh, we do all kinds of things. If you're interested in finding out more, uh, please do go to our website, www.socialsciencesinstitute.org, and you can learn. Also love to have you join us. Uh, would like to support uh, more webinars and public information uh, programs like this. Today, we have a really outstanding lineup of panelists. Um, what I would like to do though now, if I may, is turn the microphone over to Angel Blue. Uh, who most of you know as a very accomplished opera performer. Uh, she also is a trustee of the National Institute. So I would like her to take it away if I can. Angel? Hi, Fred. Thank you so much for this. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my teleprompter to work here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I would like to introduce you to Mark Skorka. Mark Skorka joined Opera America in 1990 as president CEO. Since then, Opera America has awarded nearly $20 million in grants to member companies and their partners to support the creation and production of new works, encourage innovative practices in all areas of administration and production, increase civic practice and audience development activities and promote racial justice across the opera industry. During this time, membership in Opera America has increased from 120 opera companies to, near, to nearly 3,000 organizations and individuals, including myself, with another 18,000 subscribers receiving a variety of free and fee-based services. Mark Skorka conducts strategic planning retreats for opera companies and other cultural institutions internationally. And he has participated on panels for federal, state, and local funding agencies, as well as for numerous private organizations. He appears frequently in the media on a variety of cultural issues, something that I know is very important to the National Institute of Social Sciences. I had the pleasure of meeting Mark in 2019 when I was invited to do an in-conversation with Opera America, and I was completely struck by how not only interested and invested he was in my journey, but in the opera journey as a whole. So I hope that everyone will enjoy today's webinar, What's Next in Opera? Mark, over to you. Angel, thank you so much. It is an incredible honor to be introduced by you uh, by such an esteemed artist and someone who is really making you know, the, the future of opera very bright through your, your grace and your talent. Thanks so much for your kind introduction. Um, and it is a pleasure to be with everyone on, on today's webinar. Uh, you've seen on the slides that we have a really, really distinguished panel. Um, Anthony Roth Costanzo, whom I've known for years and years, just today's leading countertenor with upcoming engagements in Brooklyn this weekend, I know, and at the Metropolitan Opera. Denise Graves, a great friend and an extraordinary singer, artist, philanthropist. The new Denise Graves Foundation has some really exciting projects underway. Denise is working to make real changes in our field. 
uh, Davy Lomeli, who is now the uh, chief artistic officer at the Santa Fe Opera, but he's also a casting consultant at the Bavarian State Opera. I know that he's coming to us from Munich today, so thank you for the time zone change. He's also a consultant at the Dallas Opera, which was his artistic home for many years until going over to Santa Fe. And then Jim Robinson, the artistic director of Opera Theater of St. Louis, one of the leading opera festivals in the United States. He's the stage director, the co-director of the opening night production at the Metropolitan Opera opening on Monday night. So Jim, perhaps you have a few butterflies in your stomach, but you know, butterflies are good. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you uh, on, the, on the webinar today. And I'm coming to you from Opera America's National Opera Center. And I'm delighted to report that in our two big halls, we have auditions, two different companies auditioning. Uh, we have a new works development workshop going on in another space and voice lessons and coaching sessions in many of our studios. Uh, although we are not on the other side of COVID by any means, it is lovely nonetheless to hear the cacophony of working artists here at the National Opera Center reminding us why we do what we do and the love we have for that wonderful sound. The past 18 months have just been extraordinary and never did we imagine that the opera field could change so dramatically and so rapidly in such a short time. Normally our production activity takes years to realize commissioning new works, developing new productions, hiring singers years in advance to make sure they have availability in their schedules. But suddenly uh, opera became improvisatory. Whoever thought that we would be improvising in opera, but companies were doing that of, of all sizes. Uh, of trying to figure out what they could do online, in parks, in tents, in parking lots. And at the same time, and all the credit is due to them, our artists were the first ones to start this improvisatory new world of opera with home recitals on their cell phones, then to podcasts and interview series with their uh, artist friends. It's been an amazing time of change um, and as I say, improvisation, all the while, as we as an industry continue to work to advance gender parity uh, and, and racial justice. So these last 18 months have been extraordinary. And as I say, they've, the last 18 months have given rise to more questions than answers. And I, I've sort of organized today's discussion into five areas of questioning, building on some suggestions from Angel. So we have achieved a new level of creativity and of delivery platforms to provide opera to opera lovers and newcomers to the art form through COVID. But what of these changes, what of, what of these discoveries will remain, remain with us? What are we to hold on to? Another one is you know, with all of this digital work, live streams, uh, especially, you know, podcast, how will we develop a hybrid model for opera in the future where we enjoy stage performances in the theater, which for us are, you know, the essence of opera, along with this life on digital platforms where people around the world, people in rural areas, people who are just curious about opera can learn more. So what, what does that hybrid future really look like and how has it extended our creative expressiveness one of the things that I think has been so important uh, over the last 18 months is the degree to which artists, because of their inventiveness, their creative talent, have really moved into the center of, of, of opera decision-making. Uh, when I think about the way Anthony, for instance, curates his own incredible production performances, it's not an opera company conceptualizing it, it's, it's Anthony conceptualizing it, artists moving into the driver's seat of what we produce and how we produce it. So how has the role of the artist changed and how will that will continue into the future? As I said, we have been working toward um, gender parity and racial justice. Um, I'm very happy, for instance, that of the seven new board members who were elected to Opera America's board in June, all of them were women, six of them were women of color. It is wonderful that in Texas, we have four women general directors at Austin, San Antonio, 
Fort Worth and now in Houston. And of those four women, two of them are of color. We are making progress, but will it be sustained? Is it authentic? Are we really doing the work that needs to be done to make opera reflect the country we want to serve? And then my final point is, although we are tracking it daily, it may be uh, new to some of our audience members that opera companies have been the recipients of very generous support from the federal government over the last 18 months. There's the payroll protection program, which came out in two phases, PPP1 and PPP2, as we say. There was the important program, the, say, uh, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grants, SVOG, first draw, second draw, they came in two phases. The employer retention tax credit. In, in a country where public support has been about 1% of an annual operating budget, opera alone has received tens of millions of dollars. My guess is it's between 150 and $200 million from the federal government to make us ready to uplift our communities and help with the healing that must follow the disruption of COVID. But with that public money comes public responsibility. How are our companies planning to or currently delivering civic value, public value in honor of this support that we've received of public taxpayer money? So lots of big questions going forward about what the future of opera looks like. I've asked each of our panelists to choose one of these five points. Which point really resonated most with them? They're gonna just offer some, some informal opening remarks. We'll see whether they've all chosen the same point or not. And we'll examine both the points they've chosen and the points they haven't so that we, um, we really get a three-dimensional view of what opera is, what's going on in opera. Uh, you have the Q&A function. Uh, please do put your questions in anytime. And I know that they'll be fed to me throughout the program so I can weave them into our conversation. I promised everyone that I would go in alphabetical order by first name. Uh, and being someone whose last name begins with an S, I always like the first name because it gives me an advantage of moving forward in the alphabet to an M. Uh, the same must be true, true for you, Anthony. So um, starting with Anthony Roth Costanzo, welcome, great to see you. And which, which of these points resonated most with you? Well, thank you, Mark. And I, I first want to say how honored I am to be in this incredible company, these people that I respect tremendously, um, including you, Mark, of course. And uh, and so thank you for inviting me today. Um, and, I, you know, your first question, which was, you know, how do artists discover a new level of creativity and, and teamwork and audience interest really resonated with me. And, and something else you, you just mentioned, which is sort of how do we give artists agency? And I think the pandemic has furthered that question. And what I wanted to talk about is something that I learned during the pandemic. You know, I, I called up uh, Deborah Borda, who's the president and CEO of the New York Philharmonic. And I said, I have this terrible idea, which is, you know, what about a pickup truck and going around New York? But really the, the core of the idea was, how, was something I've been thinking about for many years, which is how do we create points of access? And points of access go two ways. In, in one way, you know, how do we create a point of access for different audiences to what we do? But almost more important is how do we create points of access within our insular world of opera and classical music to other people's perspectives, other people's voices, other people's artistic, you know, um, angles. And so, by bringing this first this pickup truck and then this other truck all around New York and I produced and created this initiative called Bandwagon with the New York Phil which turned out to be very successful and we did over 130 concerts in New York uh, over the pandemic. Um, one thing I learned about that I just wanted to share was this uh, thing from 1969 called Arnstein's Ladder of Degrees of Citizen Participation. and. Basically, if you imagine a ladder with lots of rungs, the bottom third is categorized as non-participation. And that's what I see a lot of us in this industry do, thinking that we're doing the good thing, which is informing, 
therapy, or sometimes manipulation. Then in the second category, there's tokenism, which is kind of placation consultation information. And in the top category is citizen control. And that's where we want to get. And that begins with participation, but then moves into delegation and citizen control. So as I went on this journey with my colleagues at the New York Phil and different artists and composers and musicians around the city, what I was interested in as we were in communities throughout New York, which is a very diverse place, is how could we hand over control of our art form in certain ways? How could we hand over our resources, the resources of a major institution, such that the, the community that we were in had control of it and we, our artistic practice was being formed around that or in reaction to it or in partnership with that. And what we found, for example, um, in our partnership with the National Black Theater was this incredible way that we created beautiful art, we created meaningful relationships, and we created a pathway toward collaboration in the future, which was not gonna be on the bottom rungs of the ladder in terms of informing, but was rather going to be about um, providing agency to other organizations, other communities, and in a way that came from artists. Well, you know, Anthony, what a, what a great, great opening statement. I have a few follow-up questions for you. That was just terrific. Um, I first, be, we have an, an audience that just may need to hear more about what we mean by artist agency, because, um, you know, it is the case that when Anthony or Denise arrive at an opera company, you know, they, they have the score, let's call it either you know, Carmen or uh, Orlando or Satyagraha, and the composer has told you what notes to sing and what words to sing in the rhythm, and the conductor tells you what the tempo is going to be, and the stage director, even beloved stage directors like Jim Robinson, tell you where to move and what to do, and the costumer has told you what to wear, and the makeup people, for the most part, have changed your look, and this is what you look like, so that you are you're a great talent, but everyone tells you what to do. So what do you mean by artist agency as the other side of that, that coin? My belief uh, is that everything we do as artists have to be to create a win-win situation. And we are generally working with these opera companies where we are just sort of cogs in a wheel on, on some level, even though we're the talent. And what I have felt in terms of creating agency, I'll use a specific example. When I went to do Akhenaten at the Met, I thought, okay, how can we make this a win for me and a win for the Met and a win for the community? And the answer to me was, well, if I were to sell out this production entirely, it would certainly bolster my reputation. It would be good for the Met. And it would also mean that new audiences were coming in. But how can we do that? And so. My, instead of trying to disrupt the complicated machinery of the Met, which I respect greatly, what I tried to do was add to it in a way which made that institution see me as someone who had valid points of view and valid uh, things to contribute. And so I created a community initiative uh, where we had students uh, and all kinds of young artists make a response piece to Akhenaten. We took it to the Brooklyn Museum. We uh, had thousands and thousands of people see it in a free live performance that was a part of one of the museum's programs. And it generated buzz, it generated interest. But to answer your question, it gave me as an artist a kind of agency within that institution, within different departments. And so the question that we have to ask as opera singers and I think as artists is, what can we do to further the mission of the institutions that we're in, but also to further our own artistic objectives. And we really have to be our own CEOs. We have to be our own entrepreneurs, our own impresarios, whatever the word is. We cannot rely anymore on an opera company to get it right. Not because they're incompetent or they don't, but because we need as many great minds working on pushing this art form forward. Thank you. I, that's a great example and a great explanation. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this question. Then I, the other question I want to follow up with was, let, let's say the, the incredible work that the New York Philharmonic did, and frankly, across the country that so many opera companies did 
other cultural institutions to be present during COVID in whatever way is possible. I know there was the opera truck in Dallas. Uh, David will talk more about your, your incredible material uh, online. Um, but will that continue once you're back at, you know, finally at David Geffen Hall? The, one, one of my concerns in our field is that some of the really wonderful work that's been done to bring our art into the community may be left in the dust when we can get back into the theater where we have all of the good acoustics and the lighting equipment and the dressing rooms. Um, it was hard to improvise outdoors in tents in drive-in movie theaters. So do you feel that the effort that was made, let's say at the Philharmonic, a program you helped design, will it continue or will it stop once you're back doing 30 weeks of subscription concerts a year? This is a concern I have as well. Um, and I'm really happy to say with respect to the Philharmonic that, you know, first of all, we were um, very successful in our marketing and press of this initiative, so much so that it wound up raising money and excitement about the institution. And so what I think it showed and what I think um, I, I hope we can learn from it is that engagement is not the side dish. It's not that department over there but it's actually connected to marketing. It's connected to ticket selling. It's connected to all the things that drive opera companies to do what they do. And so we can't think of it as like, oh yeah, we, well, we got to put our resources behind marketing and then we also can do some engagement on the side. They go hand in hand. I think that's one way to help frame it for, for companies. But the other thing I will say is that, uh, you know, now that I have the opportunity to be the artist in residence at the New York Philharmonic this year, I can ensure that the work carries forward and the relationships that were built over the pandemic were very meaningful and deep. And so instead of now when we call up the National Black Theater and say, hey, you know, could we put together this event? And they go, well, why would we want to do that with the New York Philharmonic that's never showed any interest in us in, you know, a hundred years? They say, oh, well, we actually had a good time doing what we're doing. So uh, yeah, you know, what do you want to do? And the answer to that, what do you want to do question is crucial. And I, I hope that what we learned during the pandemic is to ask our partners what they want to do and let that steer us, let that guide us as artists, let that inspire us. Ultimately, as an artist, I can tell you, it makes better art. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you. And um, I agree completely. One of our wonderful consultants, Mark Valdez, uh, who's writing a paper for us on civic practice, talks about the aesthetics of engagement, the art of engagement, that it is art. And those performances are art. Working with other communities is an art form. And that we need to be as proud of that art as we are of all of the other art that we create. So uh, right on, Anthony. Thank you for that. Um, going in alphabetical order by first name, David, you're next up. And uh, which of these points captured your attention and would you like to speak about? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you everybody to, to have me here. Um, I particularly, I connected with, with one of the questions that was what, what did you guys did? Like, like what is your particular story of, of COVID and that could resonate about the future of opera? No? And, and, and I am thrilled because I, I had a, a very, very active part on, on the trench in, in, the, in, in the Dallas Opera front. Um, so particularly with this time, I would like to talk about a project that we started in the beginning of the pandemic in Dallas and taking in account that COVID-19 pandemic imposed digital platforms as the only means for people to maintain social emotional connection. We really dive there. The artistic department of the Dallas Opera converted into a media and engineering department. We played influencers for real. We call it the Tidio Network. And we went at it as a very professional strategy to use social media platforms to expand who, what, and how we do what we do, but mostly to create a fandom experience. And this platform was used to address also three vital aspects of the quarantine period, survival of the organization, find a way to keep adding value to the community that we serve and find those two first steps in a safe way during COVID while losing massive amount of revenue. We created a 50-50 diverse lineup of content creators slash artists 
that could offer a bar of content with different access points of the social media user experience to connect with us. So there was always a, a backbone of opera, but we cooked, we baked, we did yoga, we had tenor comparisons, we we went and compared high seas. We have social justice shows. The stars and rising of stars were featured. We had education and community outreach television shows. Everything that had to go with opera, we did it. We didn't have an archive as the Metropolitan Opera or the Royal Opera House. So we created more than 30 original web series with more than 300 hours of content. We launched an app to deliver large exclusive content available in almost every platform today in iOS and Google. But most importantly, we learn a massive amount of data that is helping us to cast, program, market, and fundraise way more efficient because we created our own intellectual property to distribute content. We created a highway. We have now innovated in an institutional distribution partnership similar like the MAC movie chain and a Hollywood studio. Opera Parallel just debuted Everest, a long animated feature film in our platform. Today, the Tidion Network has close to 300 million views in classical music. And we have connected with more than 30 countries in average per day, with a total of 70 countries that have viewed our content. The structure was exactly of empowering the artist. We pay them per post. We created a system of payment for digital products today. The Dallas Opera regular competes every week with the Royal Opera House and the Metropolitan Opera House to be the most interactive opera company in the world with less than 10% of their overall budget. The biggest number of audiences that we connected are in the demographic group of 18 to 34 years of age. Diversity, multi-access points to your audience, an artist driving editorial, and habit-forming techniques to ensure the long-term of the expansion of the brand have proved to be key points of success and has made us really, really, really cool to, to do this. Yeah. David, it, it was an extraordinary achievement. And, uh, you know, I congratulate you so much on what you've done. Now, when the company is back to producing as much wonderful opera at the Windspear as it possibly can, will this effort continue with the same intensity? Can you sustain your life as a producing company in the opera house and your life as a producer of digital content? Well, it, it did force the opera company because of this uh, successful endeavor uh, to be in, uh, to add a department. You know, now we have a staff that is dedicated to the Tidion network and the Dallas Opera TV application. Uh, and so that forced to kind of create a different bandwidth and a different, and created almost like a mission of the company to adapt to a dual aspect. We, we are a very specific brand of opera when we are live in the Windsor serving Texas, but we're very, very expanded and a little bit different when we go worldwide and in social media channels. Um, so I think that for me, no matter what, and I have seen it in Nielsen or in the Ministry of Culture uh, of India the other day that I was searching for some, some, some materials. Every single people in the world are spending five plus hours in digital devices today. So if we're not present there, we're not going to be as relevant more and more in the real physical world. So for me, it's also a way to connect different and further audience. So Dallas is buying the package and it's committing to, to, cons to consistently try to keep that digital presence as much as their physical presence in the wing sphere. You know, uh, I, I froze up for a second, David. So, uh, you know, sorry, sorry for that, but I, I'm, I'm back with you right now. I, you know, again, you know, it is, it's great to hear of a sustained commitment to this. And I do believe that some hybrid format, even if you are not, transmitting live performances, but all kinds of content around it is, is certainly going to be a part of our future. I just read a research report from AMS, a, a, a consulting firm that works in the arts. And in it, it said that 88% of arts attenders have said that um, online content will play a much smaller role in their lives once they get back to the theater. So it may be that a lot of the Dallas Opera family watch your content because there wasn't anything else to do. Um, 
It may be that when they are back at the opera and at the symphony and enjoying their regular activities as cultural consumers, that they may not consume your digital content. Will you still want to do it even though it may not be your local audience that is consuming the content? I, I believe so. You know, I think we normally the way that we distribute content in Dallas Opera is that we start digitally. Also, you can target geographical zones and we also we can target the people that have certain behaviors or consumers in social media because unfortunately, social media gathers a lot of our habits and, and we can do it there. So uh, it is it is is very particular in that sense. So what we are doing is actually transforming a little bit the content into into shorter attention span content experiences. Uh, we, are, we are going more for the one to 15 seconds or X amount of type of content to keep our media present and to enhance the fandom experience. And that, that's one of the things that I felt that was gonna be needed a lot when we went into the TDO network. It's like, where are the groups? How can we gather to, 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 to talk about uh, Placido versus Luciano. How can we gather about, you know, the, the BIPO community to talk about how they're feeling in their opera and how can they further certain parts of their agenda? So they still have these parts of necessities that are incredibly well served through digital platforms. I, I see and I expect a, a drop on of engagement, but if we want to survive, and that's how we feel at least in, in with the TDO network team, that if we want to be relevant in our community, in our society, and, and, and as an art form, we have to have a very important presence digitally too. So we are, we are yes, we are going to transform a little, we're going to adapt, but we still have to have to be there in, on le- and because that enhances also fundraising and sales. So um, and, and a quick commercial, how do people find this content? Where do they go? Uh, most of our, our content channels are in Facebook and, and Instagram. And now you can download the application Dallas Opera TV and um, in you know, the App Store and the Google Store. And we have been featured heavily in 35 more pieces, uh, you know, variety in your times, a lot of pieces. So there's, there's a lot of information out there. Right. But thank you for giving us the commercial. Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> David, anytime. Denise, I have watched you nodding in agreement and just being provoked by the comments here. Which of the points that I laid out in, in, my, in my verbose email, which, which of the points really resonated with you the most? And you're, you're, on, you're on mute. <laughs> How many times have we said that? Oh, I know, I, mean, I, I did it at the beginning of the session. You'd think we would know. Uh, First of all, I'd like to say that I am delighted and also honored to be here to share in this panel discussion with such esteemed colleagues whom I um, admire uh, greatly. So it's it's an honor to be here. So thank you for for the invitation. Yes, there's so much to say here. um, And in terms of what really resonated with me, there's a lot to say there too, uh, because so much of it did. And uh, and I'm just so happy to be here to be learning so much. Um, I guess, I guess, I, I would it would sort of maybe fall under the a category of artist agency because I am uh, a professor uh, in the conservatories, um, working at Juilliard and at the Peabody Conservatory, and because I have young developing artists who, once this happened, everybody was scrambling in terms of how we're going to survive and what happens next. And this was as long as you weren't ill or are having to deal with a family member that was ill this incredible pause was also a gift in so many, many ways because it really allowed us to be introspective and to really look at what we're doing with our lives and, and, and where, this, um, where this career is going. Um, in advance of this conversation, I spoke to a lot of my students to ask their opinion about where they thought um, opera was headed. And they had some very interesting um, things that I just wanted to share. One one, um, woman said to me that it knocked us off of our pedestals and it got us into the communities that before we never left the opera house, people always came into the opera house. And now all of a sudden, as someone mentioned earlier, we were in the parking lots and in golf courses and and we actually took opera to the people and that people seem to be in it for... um, 
uh, for the experience of it. And again, speaking to what Anthony said in terms of being able to tell new and exciting um, stories are super, super important. And I am sure we all recognize that. But one of the things that another student said to me is that um, they thought that audiences want this to be Instagrammable. Um, and I think that speaks to what David was saying earlier in terms of the attention span and, and, and being able to receive, um, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, new and interesting material. And that in some ways is that in some ways that the newer generation or the, the, the younger people um, one student said, if it was left up to us, this, this is what we'd like to see, um, that we just can't sing anymore. We just, it's, it's not enough to just be a singer. The, and, and I've actually heard this from, um, from the agencies as well, that they are also interested in artists who have other things going on that are not just singers, but that are people who are uh, interested in moving um, the the art form forward and moving the industry forward and and one of the things that we've I think the sing, a lot of singers have felt empowered during this time because speaking to what you said earlier about you know we have been recreators and and I think that our whole education has been you know since little people coming up that our parents have the answers and then your teachers have the answers and then certainly as artists you come in and and the composer has says this and the director says that and all the, and we have not exercised that muscle um in coming to the table in terms of being really creative contributors to the art form and and i think that that was one of the great advantages that i certainly saw happen amongst my students um, in, in this period of pause is that we learn so much about ourselves and we learn so much that actually we have ideas too. And there, there are a lot of, and, and we need all of it. We, this is sort of a all hands on deck situation where we needed input and everybody's um, particular point of view was valuable and, and, and needed. So one of the things that I've seen happen so much is that it's really given birth to I think a lot of artists feeling empowered and feeling like, um, you know, we don't have to be sort of little mice in the background and, and wait for the director to say something or the conductor to say something that we, we could actually contribute to that conversation and to how this art form gets shaped and how we move forward, um, uh, how we move forward together. So that's probably one of the things that I've been most excited about to see um, what it's given birth um, what that has given birth to uh, amongst these students and that and then they feel like we really do have we, we really can be in the driver's seat as it were um, going forward and that we don't have to wait for someone to create an opportunity for us that we can actually create that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know and Denise I, I want to talk about agency in two different dimensions. Um, and, you know, cooking with Denise was, you know, became a very popular activity as, you know, people watched you work your magic in the kitchen of, you know, uh, all these wonderful recipes. Now, of course, it, that's not opera per se, but what did it do for you as a, as a presence, as, a, as an artist, but also as an influencer? Uh, how did that give you agency? Well, so that really came from my being a mom and, and really caring about and worrying about my students. So that's really how that, uh, that idea was born because um, I, I may have shared this with you before. There was, I, I reached out to a lot of my students to see how everybody was doing because all of a sudden, right, uh, interruption, pause, what do we do now? And there was one student in particular who was really, really angry um, and angry with me for sort of encouraging her and her talent, which is the beautiful talent in this very narrow competitive field. And all of a sudden, now what are we going to do? And, and, and it costs so much to go to these schools, uh, these conservatories. And, and I was so struck by the conversation that I had with her. I thought, gosh, I've got to try to do something. I've got to do something to, to help these young people and to keep them buoyed and to keep them engaged and to keep them encouraged and to keep them uplifted. And we were all feeling sort of the same thing, sort of feeling helpless and like, what's next? Particularly, I think particularly saying all people, but certainly particular singer, particularly singers, because we were considered to be the super spreaders, right? So we were, right. that was right. So the super spreaders of love, but the super spreaders in any case, right? And so I just thought, 
gosh, what would I do? You know, if I had all my kids here, what, what we would do is we would sing and we would work in sort of in a masterclass situation and I would cook. I'd be in the kitchen cooking because I love doing that. And so, and so that idea was literally born on late Thursday night. And I got in touch with a friend of mine who's really good with technology. And I said, can we do this starting Sunday? Um, and then we had 250,000 viewers and we saw that there was a real, um, a real need to connect, a real need for community. Um, the kitchen itself is sort of, you know, the, the heart of the home. That's where everybody gathers. And when we, what we found is that um, apart from a normal interview that we would do, when people are in their own spaces, you get a different snapshot. When they're in their kitchens and in, in their homes, you get it. And when you sort of preoccupy them by doing a task so that they're not watching themselves and, and um, uh, yeah, sort of, um, you, you get a, a truer version of, of who that artist may be. And then what we found is that the comments that were being exchanged online is what was really, really, really um, something that was incredibly heartening and how people really looked forward to, because we all had to eat, right? And everybody was at home and it was just a great way to engage with artists and find out something more about them and, and laugh and create and, and to also create, to create at the, at the same time. So we created this platform where people were uh, performing, and also cooking and talking about their different projects and talking about what was going on and engaging with other artists. So we found that that was, um, it, it was something that I found certainly with, with my students that was really um, uplifting. And we met uh, and a lot of other people outside of the industry as well who have um, said that, oh my gosh, I didn't know what, the, how many times have we all heard that? We've heard that every single time for people who come to the opera for the first time who said, I had no idea that this is what it was like. Right. Um, this is my first experience, or I didn't know what an opera singer was, and I didn't know what it was like to be an opera singer. And now I'm, I'm interested, and I want to come to the opera, and I want to come to the concerts because I've had an opportunity to meet that particular artist. So that was really, really great. 250,000 followers I mean, gives you incredible influence, um, an opportunity to talk about so many things of that you're doing artistically about opera. So in doing this wonderful, casual idea, you have, you have really built great influence for yourself on, on social media. Yeah, I've got, I've got to stay in there <laughs> now with it. But I think, right. I mean, I think we've seen that happen. Uh, so many wonderful ideas come out of right, ne necessity, right, is the mother of invention. So it was me just trying to find a way to reach out and to connect and encourage my students. And in the meantime, we created something very, very different that uh, none of us had, uh, you know, could have imagined. So, yeah. Now, I also, in, in terms of agency, wanted to give you a moment to talk about the Denise Graves Foundation, uh, you. which you have been working so hard to launch with, with great stuff. So tell us a little, a little bit about that, Denise. So it, it, again, it stems from this conversation with this young woman who was really angry. It's it's incredible what can happen in, in you know <laughs> in those kind of moments. But I, I saw a student of mine um, who lives in Pittsburgh singing on the steps of the National Negro Opera Company, um, the the home of. Uh, the National Negro Opera Company that Mary Cardwell Dawson built. And she talked about how this um, building was dilapidated and was going and had fallen into disrepair um, and that we needed to bring awareness to it. So I got in touch with my students again and I said, listen, we're going to do a project as a studio and here's what I need you to do. I need everybody to sing an aria and upload uh, that with the hashtag save the National Opera House. I thought I was contributing to a project that was there. I had no idea what we were building. I had no clue, you know, as they say, no good deed ever goes unpunished. I thought that I was creating to and bringing awareness to this project because so many people don't know about Mary Cardwell Dawson, about the tremendous contribution that she has made uh, and what an incredible trailblazer she was. So she created this back in the, uh, 1940, by the way, this National Negro Opera Company, because um, at that time the theaters were not open to um, artists of color. And so she hired 1600 singers and she hired the orchestra and the designers and the directors and, and conductors and all those people. And she created this opera company and took it all 
all over the world, including the Metropolitan Opera before Marian Anderson, um, because it was the first time that the Metropolitan Opera had allowed uh, an, an independent opera company to rent the space. But it wasn't just that. It, it was this um, opera company that had chapters in Cleveland, in Chicago, in New York, in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., where she where she lived. But it was also a music school. So she taught over some 600 kids. Uh, Robert McFerrin, one of her students, the, the, the father of Bobby McFerrin, uh, Ahmad Jamal, the great uh, jazz pianist. And so while she did not have the career that she sought out, her, her calling was actually much greater. And she launched the careers of so many others and created, you know, something amazing. But this uh, monument, which still stands, but barely, but it's still standing, was also a safe house. So, um, so jazz greats like Count Basie, Lena Horne, Duke Ellington, uh, you know, Cab Calloway. Um, this was during the time of segregation. So the hotels were not open to them. So they had to have some place to stay. I don't know if any of you remember the film, The Green Book. Um, um, some seasons back. Um, so they stayed at the opera house. So I just found that this was incredible that we, we didn't know, most didn't know who this woman was. And why is it that she fell into obscurity, this great, great, great American who contributed so much, certainly to my experience and to so many others' experiences. Um, um, and so as we started learning more about this woman, we started uncovering in our research that there were so many others like her who have been left out of the telling of the American story. So the foundation is a cross between social justice, American history, and classical vocal arts. It's a combination of all of those things. And through our programs, we are bringing to life and celebrating the great cont contributions that so many like Mary Cardwell Dawson, um, mm -hmm have given us, and if you think that, you know, I, I, maybe I would have said that, who was the first woman impresario? Maybe we would have said, I don't know, Sarah Caldwell or uh, someone like, we would, certainly would have never, you know, said Mary Caldwell Dawson, right? Yeah. So, so that is what the foundation is doing. We are celebrating and uplifting a part um, of history that has been forgotten. And, um, and through our different programs and through our different initiatives telling, telling the story of these great American heroes. Mm. Well, talk about artist agency. I mean, it's just incredible to hear you report on this. And Denise, we, we follow your work with great admiration and enthusiasm. Well, you in particular have been incredibly helpful to us. Um, and we, 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 you know, we fell at your feet at the very beginning and, and we, we still will and said, Mark, please help us, please help guide us. Because, you know, I've spent 35 years in um, this profession on the stage, this is an entirely new lane. And, yeah. uh, and so there's so much to learn about it. And, um, and so for that, I throw myself at the feet of all, all uh, people like you and uh, these wonderful people who have been doing this for such a long time, because it's important to us that these stories get out there and it's important to us to be successful at doing it. And we have to learn. Right. And it's another, it's another time, it's not one of our questions, but the way, how many people have changed lanes during COVID because of time, reflection, opportunities. And you just you know, hit a, a really great point there, Denise. Right, one of, one of the programs that we are developing is a program called Transitions. And that is for artists who started out on the stage, but something happens, you get sick or, or you get, or you have to take care of a family member. And we ourselves are actually sort of the beta testers of that because, yeah, yeah. right, we, we are the artists turned into, um, you know, th this admin role. And so That's we're fantastic. learning as we go along. Right? Absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Denise. Thank so Jim Robinson, you know, I turned to you last alphabetically the stage director who clearly bosses everybody around and tells them where to move and what to do. Uh, you'll have a lot to say in response to what you've heard, of course. But first, let me ask you, which of the points in my, in my list uh, resonated with you? Well, thank you, Mark. And it's so great seeing so many wonderful colleagues and friends. Uh, and I'm honored to be a part of this, um, this discussion. Angel, thank you for asking me uh, to participate. Um, curiously, the, 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 the question that came up, uh, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the question a little bit, uh, how can we demonstrate the value and honor the, tax, and honor the taxpayer support we have received and hope to continue receiving? Uh, and can we expand from arts leaders to community le leaders 
uh, through the arts? And I thought that was a, a very interesting question and it sounded, um, uh, I don't wanna say it sounded a little nerdy uh, coming <laughs> for, uh, but I like that type of thing. And what I mean by nerdy is it's like, that is a question that is really in, you start getting into the weeds in an, in an arts organization. As an artistic director, I'm not always brought in to uh, all of the discussions of PPP and SVOG and all of these things. However, during the, the pandemic, um, I've become deeply involved in all of those discussions because how, of how it impacts the very product that, that we're doing, our arts organizations, our, you know, everything that we do. Um, and I, I guess the way I would respond to this, and I'm not going to talk too too much about um, you know digital platforms and things because David did it so so brilliantly. And uh, but I'm I'm thinking more about uh, the the role arts organizations, particularly an opera company, has in the community. Um, you know, a dear friend of mine uh, who's recently passed away, uh, J.D. McClatchy, Sandy McClatchy, uh, the wonderful librettist and poet used to say the only thing more expensive than opera is war. And um, opera is a very expensive enterprise. It's disproportionately expensive to produce opera. And while it costs a lot of money to do what we do, I think we have to face the reality that we're operating, a, we're, it's a niche market. It's not something for everyone. We believe because we're in in it that everybody should embrace it and fund it and 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 support it. And I think that one thing that I have learned over the the past year and a half or so um, is that it's okay to be a niche market. It's okay to to understand um, that even if you leave a small footprint, you can leave a very meaningful footprint. One of the things that I think is is possibly a challenge, uh, and this is something that we've been discussing internally at Opera Theater of St. Louis, is not to do too much. Um, to, uh, to do what you can do really, really well. I think in terms of outreach to the community and different initiatives, it's great to do a lot of things, but it eats up human capital very, very quickly because arts organizations, offer companies, are usually, uh, the, the staffs at companies are usually pretty lean. And when we start talking about taking on more and more stuff, that means we have to expand our staffs and, and, and personnel. So I like to keep it in perspective and that's something that we talk a lot about. You know, arts organizations, opera companies, have been responsible for filling a gap of uh, education in the United States. And we're just used to doing that. That is part of what we do. Every opera company has an education department. We have the uh, outreach for schools and all of that stuff. Because honestly, arts organization, uh, arts uh, education in the United States uh, has dried up a bit. It's not the way it was when I was a kid. Um, and we have to fill that role. Now, uh, along with the responsibility of, of educating young people, we also have to educate adults. And I think that community outreach and uh, how we're good uh, community leaders, in addition to arts leaders, is to make sure that we're reaching adults in a meaningful way. And that, that has to do with targeting um, very strategically um, what we think we can can handle. You know, it's something that we always talk about is we don't want to overpromise and under deliver. And I would rather do less and do it really, really well. And I think that's one way of demonstrating how we would be using money wisely from the taxpayers. The worst thing that we could do, and that not just taxpayers, but our foundations, our donors and all of that, is to embark on so many initiatives, so many things that ultimately we will not be able to sustain or that the quality will not be um, high enough. Now, I, at Opera Theater of St. Louis, I'm, I would consider myself uh, one of the, the 
senior members of the staff, just in terms of my age. We have a young, enthusiastic staff, and sometimes I feel like I'm the um, the veteran um, opera guy on staff, you know, who's been there, seen it all, and and all of that. And I love the enthusiasm enthusiasm that's generated from. Um, staff members who are, you know, in their early to mid twenties, and I love all of that stuff. But again, I I try to be very pragmatic about all of this stuff, um, and I think that if we want to be good community leaders, we have to we have to demonstrate that we're also fiscally responsible. Um, I think something that and I've talked to many heads of other companies, you know, who have received PPP and SVOG um, funding. Uh, is that that money um, is not always going to be there. And what do we do when we have to get back to, you know, business as usual? In many, many ways, a lot of companies have saved a tremendous amount of money by not producing opera because it's so expensive to produce. You know, companies are, are ha having surpluses, which I guess we have to keep quiet, but um, we have to figure out what to what to do with that and to, to work very, very um, carefully um, as we try to, to move forward. You know, they always say all, all politics is local. I think all arts organizations, all arts are local too. You have to un identify what works within your community, what your community looks like, who, who makes up your community and figure out how the best way to engage with members of your community. It's, it's been very interesting uh, seeing a lot in the press lately about um, fire shut up in my bones, which is opening the Met season and which is really thrilling. And, you know, the first opera by a black composer, Terrence Blanchard, dear friend of, of uh, mine and Denise's. And, um, and I, I'm thrilled to see all of the attention. But one thing that makes me very proud of the fact is the fact that at Opera Theater of St. Louis, this is just in our DNA. We've, you know, this is, we've had a 12 year relationship with Terrence. We've done things with, um, in terms of diversity and casting and outreach and people who are creating works. It's what we do. We started an initiative um, when we took on John Adams, The Death of Klinghoffer about 10 years ago, which was, a, it's a very controversial piece, but the, the success of it and I think because we were extremely proactive and we wanted to be good community leaders even then. So we talked to all different members of the community to tell them what that opera was and was not about. And because of that, we created a task force with different arts organizations. And we all talk about how we're working together in the community. So I guess that's just a very long way of saying that, that I believe the way moving forward is to work strategically, to be very enterprising, um, but realizing that it's okay to leave a small, meaningful footprint. Um, thank you for, for that, Jim. And uh, indeed to do what you choose to do well is so important. And uh, I think people run afoul when they just try to put a check in every box, you know, on the whole long list of things that we, we must do. A lot of, a lot of questions that, that I have and, and that have come up a bit in the, in the chat that I've been watching. You know, um, just as a few examples, uh, the San Diego Opera did a production of La Boheme at a drive-in movie theater. And uh, the San Francisco Opera performed The Barber of Seville in tents up in Marin County. And Atlanta Opera uh, performed in two festival seasons in tents. Um, and operas were made shorter. They did Bohem in 90 minutes without an intermission and, and still a very viable version of the Puccini. Um, people have been performing without intermissions in order to avoid lobby crowding. Uh, a lot of this activity has been very inexpensive. It has been casual. Uh, digitally speaking, it's been uh, when you, it's convenient for you to watch it, you can watch it from the comfort of your home. What we have heard, and we're researching this more deeply, but for a lot of this programming, between 35 and 45% of the audiences for the drive-in movie theaters, the 10 performances, have been new to the opera company. That if you, you know, uh, have 
less expensive prices, more casual settings, more adventuresome, surprising settings, shorter performances, that there are a lot of people out there who might be interested in opera. So once we are on the other side of COVID, which I hope is soon, are, are we gonna go back to three and a half hour performances with two intermissions, with really expensive tickets where everybody feels somewhat compelled by the setting to be rather formally dressed? How, how are we going to absorb what we've learned about shorter, cheaper, casual, friendlier? What, what are we gonna do with that? David, let me turn to you. You, you have your, your, your feet in several different opera companies. You know, what, are we just going to turn our back on what we've learned from this? I really hope not. You know, I, I, I really hope not. It, it, is a, it is a fight that we have to have with, with a lot of our, you know, the, the economic power in the United States comes mostly for individual given. And so if the main individual giver is not a user on Facebook, but it represents your 35% of your income to the company, then there's, there's an education process that has to happen because we cannot bow down by sacrificing the today for the 30 years in the future. For me, it's just my, 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 my gathering of what I see. I, I get, I get a little concerned sometimes. And, and I know that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not the water for everybody. Right. But I have studied a lot social studies about it, specifically this movement. And when I see that the five biggest budgets of the business worldwide represent only 2 million Facebook legacy users, I'm concerned because Kim Kardashian has 180 million, right? <laughs> so at the same time, we're, we're billion, several billion dollar industry too. So how can we actually make it as loud as that, that we exist, that we move that transaction, that we're international, that we're accepting, that we're profitable and we belong if we are not shouting it just because we don't want to get in Facebook, because we don't want to get in YouTube, because, because it's part of every single entertainment industry or education aspect of the human experience today is through technology. But every time I, I, I have to say that it's, it's very difficult to span sometimes uh, the offering or the technology or keep this development of audience uh, that happens through social media without the buy-in of the main funders of the company. So, you know, like, I really believe that whoever is, is watching, this is an investment that it might not pay today and it might not pay in the next five years the way that we see it. But if we're not there by the time that we're not spending five or eight hours, but 12 a day hooked to a screen, it's going to be really tough to gain mm -hmm. that mark, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's for me. A Anthony, and as both a creator, a producer, and a performer, all of it, um, yeah, we've learned that surprising venues, un the unexpected, the shorter, the casual, the less expensive, there's an audience for opera that hasn't been routinely attending performances in the opera house. And you have a foot in the opera house and a foot out of the opera house. How do, how do you metabolize this conflict between the accessibility that we've loved and in a way the barriers that are a part of our business as it was? I don't believe that there's anything fundamentally alienating about the art itself, you know, about what we sing, about the way we sing it. You know, people don't actually care that it's in another language. I mean, having done an opera in ancient Egyptian where we don't put subtitles, you know, people still can love it if they don't know what the words are. But I think that the structures around that art are what alienate people and it for different reasons, either because it's expensive, because they feel there's no connection to it, because they feel they're not represented there. So I think that in order to, as you say, metabolize the experiences that people have in these smaller, more intimate, more you know, connected venues, what we have to do is figure out ways that it's not, uh, we don't go, we don't create those opportunities and then expect someone to show up at the opera, but rather create a sort of trail of breadcrumbs and change what happens in the experience at those larger venues such that they start to feel a connection. Now, with my friends, I have lots of friends and family who, who don't like opera at all, but as I've tried to bring them along, um, 
the more that they have experiences with it, the more that they get excited about different aspects of it and learn. And I think we've all experienced, you know, I know myself, I've learned a lot about Wagner and I didn't particularly like Wagner. You know, I don't sing Wagner and, you know, all of that <laughs> stuff as I've, as I've gone on. So it, it is a question of repeated exposure, but why would these people come to the opera? Just because you found them in some small event and offered them a 20% discount, that's not enough to get them there. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the thinking around what actually happens uh, at, at the opera, I mean, I will just say quickly, um, one thing I did as I was, as I was uh, in 2018 releasing my first album, Glass Handle, was to create a really interdisciplinary performance, which happened at St. John the Divine and at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, and um, collaborated with luminaries from fashion, film, art, and dance. And the audience that showed up were audiences who came to see Raph Simmons, the fashion designer, or George Kondo, the painter, Tilda Swinton's film, or whatever it might have been or, or, you know, Micheline Thomas's incredible painting. So, you know, the, they then heard opera music and said, oh, you know, that's not so bad. And they then had a, a, a way to connect to it. Um, and so I think creating more opportunities like that, the show that I'm doing at St. Anne's Warehouse now is playing to an audience that goes to the theater. Mm -hmm. And another performer, this incredible trans cabaret performer, Justin Vivian Bond, who, uh, who speaks a different language artistically. But when we put these two things together, what we found is that the theater goers or the fans of Vivian go, you know, I love that song by Liszt that was in German that I knew nothing about. So, you know, the question for me is how we, how we then leave those breadcrumbs and the ways in which we do it as we go back into these larger spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Anthony, I, I, I'm not. Ta I'm talking about the the generic Acme Grant Opera Company. Here you are performing in Brooklyn through the weekend, uh, performing St. John the Divine at Barnes, and then you walk into Acme Grant Opera Company. And what do you that that puts on opera with with the traditional red velvet and tassel accoutrements? Um, what do you wish you could say to the general director of, you know, Acme Grand Opera about connecting the dots from accessible on the one hand to barrier creating on the other hand? Well, I guess, I mean, that's a complicated question uh, and a great one um, and one that I would want to, you know, expound on for a long time. But I think, um, first of all, the way that we present opera traditionally is wonderful. We, I think all of us here love the tradition and we want to honor it and we want to uphold it, but we also need to embroider it. So I would, I would urge, um, I would urge the general directors to think of the artists that they are bringing in to interpret these great works and how, how we're thinking creatively about doing that. But at the same time, I really believe in a kind of grassroots engagement, even at the largest Acme company. Um, it's a, it's a one by one kind of, uh, uh, thing that I don't see happening. So, you know, one thing that I have done recently, uh, is reached out to the director of marketing for a dating application um, and said, could we advertise a special under 40 event that we do on your dating application and, you know, mobilize around that? So how, what's going on in that city, in that community that we can, and, you know, I think David does an incredible job of this, uh, obviously in Dallas, but even in Santa Fe, the way that we brought the filmed operas out into the community and provided free opportunities for engagement with the product. Everyone I talked to, waiters in restaurants, they knew about the Santa Fe Opera. They knew that it was this special thing. Uh, so I think that we have to get creative in our marketing, in our in our reach, in terms of engagement in a grassroots way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Denise, you know, your great career was uh, punctuated by incredibly memorable performances of Carmen, of Dalila, of the other works of your repertoire, the grand opera pieces. And, and now you are feeling the incredible joy of, of local impact in Pittsburgh and with what you're doing as a teacher. 
you know, how do you navigate the, the, the division between kind of a barrier filled opera house that scares away a lot of people and, and the way you want people to enjoy opera as you're cooking in the kitchen with them? How, how do you navigate that? I would just echo everything that Anthony just so eloquently stated. Um, and, and also one of the comments that my students made about uh, bringing opera into the community. This is a, a question that, you know, has been asked since, certainly since as long as I've been in the profession, right? Uh, how do we stimulate and engage new people to come to the opera and to become subscription holders, you know, and, and, and is this something that belongs in a museum or if, is, is this something that's going to be relevant and that people respond to? I think we see a lot of it happening. And I, I just wanted to um, respond to something that um, Jim said earlier about um, the telling of these different stories being in the DNA of Opera Theater St. Louis. And um, I, start, I started out back in um, 1988 with Opera Theater of St. Louis that engaged me to do something really, really, really unusual in terms of educational outreach. And that was, you know, actually taking opera into the prisons and to community centers and stuff like that. And that was back in the day. So I think that everything that everybody's saying, certainly what we just heard Anthony say, and what we hear some of the younger generations saying in terms of, you know, we know that this is a profession that suffers under uh, this stereotype that people think that, oh, you know, I, I don't know what they're talking about, or you know, uh, you, you, I need to have a musicology degree to understand what's going on, um, and they don't realize that you know it's been in so many movies that they've seen, or in commercials, or in video games, and that it's actually been integrated and been a part of our cultural history, uh, a part of our everyday living anyway. Um, I think it is just the question, and and then there are those that I think want it very much to be sort of an elitist art form. There are those who want it to be not so accessible to everybody as well, um, because they want it to be something that's very special and, you know, that you have to get, you know, dressed up to go to and, um, and, and, and to keep it something special because everything else, we get a steady diet of all the time anyway, right? film and movies and all these different things that are, you know, the pop music and the stuff that's infiltrated in our li everyday living. There are those who want to keep opera sort of, you know, I, I, I was just, um, I was just, I just did a recital in Bay Harbor, Michigan, and I'd never been there. It was gorgeous. And everybody said, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody that we are here and that this beautiful place exists because we don't want everybody, you know, coming. Mm -hmm. So it's the sort of same idea that some people feel about going to the opera. They want to keep it up very special. But in terms of being able to, and, and somebody mentioned also hybrid too. Um, and I think that a lot of the stories that we're seeing being told now, we, we know that we, we looked at the season before the shutdown, it was Akhenaten and, and Jim's Porgy and Bess that you couldn't get a ticket to, right? And why was that? Why was that? Um, people were, I had people in my building saying, oh my gosh, are you in that? I want to come see that, you know, and, 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 and certainly the telling of different stories is also, uh, I think, supremely important that it is relatable, you know, that people can really feel like they really understand and that they know these individuals. I, I think that, you know, you can get the average Joe to come to the opera and they can say, oh, that was absolutely beautiful. And I, and I didn't understand what it was about, but it's something really different. You know, I had the great pleasure some years ago of premiering the Margaret Garner um, work of Richard Danapur. And there were no coachings really on that uh, production. And I thought, yeah, wait a minute, it's in English. Hang on, this is an American story, a story we know. I know all about this, the Southern black experience. And so for us, and certainly for me, there was a feeling of like, wow, I, I already know this story. And, and, they, and they packed people into um, the theater every night. So much of it has to do with education, of course, educational outreach and getting it out there and getting the community involved and excited about it, getting the school kids to have, read the stories about it and have them come to the rehearsals. That's how I got into opera. I was a student at uh, high school and, and Washington Opera extended, uh, you know, tickets to come to the dress rehearsal of, of Beethoven's Fidelio. And I was like, what is this? Oh, my God, what in the world is this? And so that, that is impactful. We know that. 
And, and I think that we see that happening. Mark, um, some years ago, I went to a conference of Opera America when you all were talking about civic impact. Um, and, and so we all know that we've got to get out there and we've got to do a, a better job at, at bringing it to people and, and exposing it to people and sharing it with people in a fun way that it's not intimidating and not, um, you know, yeah, that's not intimidating. That's Jim, you're, 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 as a stage director, shorter, casual, um, no intermissions, um, venues that weren't built as theaters, um, you know, and then back into the theater, two intermissions, three hours. I was just looking at the ticket brochure. Then, then I bought a bunch of tickets to go to the Met. I'm here in New York. And uh, the next one I bought was for Meister Singer. It starts at 6 p.m. and it goes until 11.50 p.m. Uh, so how do you as a stage director, recognizing that you have an audience that has a set of sensibilities about how they spend their evening, what they'd like to do with their evening, what time they want to get home, um, do you hear about a 90 minute, one act, no intermission bohème and are horrified or intrigued? And then how do you, how do you keep what, again, what we've learned when you go back into the opera house? You know, I think, I think you can do it all. I mean, I, I think there's definitely a place for a 90 minute bohème, you know, particularly these days, uh, or, you know, during, during the pandemic, so many initiatives with, you know, do, do a bohème in, a, uh, in 90 minutes at a drive-in theater. That's fantastic, I think. This past year at Opera Theater of St. Louis, for example, we, um, we were not performing in our theater. We were performing in a theater we built in a parking lot. Um, and we had very grand plans to do some things that were, uh, you know, pretty much standard opera length, you know, two acts of an hour each and all of that. And we very quickly decided to jettison that idea and go with, uh, everything around, say everything is under 70 minutes, no intermission. Um, and it worked for for what we for what we did and it, and it and it made a huge impact the whole thing sold out the whole season sold out in in a couple of days which was which was great but um well and then there were some people who said you should do this every year you know we we like being outside i mean they said that before the really brutally hot weather hit <laughs> right uh, so they said that then. Uh, and then the other thing was, this is great. We can actually go see uh, a short opera and have dinner afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we had to say, look, that we're not really set up to do that. Um, however, one thing that we did learn was we can do some of that during the year. Um, but it's hugely expensive just to produce anything. And, um, and we weren't really looking for ticket revenue. Um, but I, I, I believe one of the big things is we we're going to have to kind of re-educate the audience a little bit about, okay, if, if you want to get back to normal, whatever that is, uh, it's a huge time commitment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've been thrown a, a lot of different ideas for projects um, you know, a condensed version of this or that. And I'm, I'm a little on the fence about it. I really am. Um, you know, I have to say, you know, personally, going back into the theater, uh, seeing some things, you know, I was in Santa Fe, saw Anthony's show, saw a couple of other things there. And uh, the first thing that struck me was, wow, opera's long, isn't it? Because I had only been to things <laughs> that were about 60 minutes long or yeah, less. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David, what, what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, you know, we have gotten used, and, and, or if we're watching something at home that's streaming, we do get up, we walk around, we sit back down at the computer screen. And uh, I have, yeah, I've been to a few full length, including Anthony's wonderful performance in Santa Fe. And yeah, it's a long sit. Uh, how do you reconcile yourself to the fact that a lot of people enjoy the shorter form, but we're a long form art form. How do we reconcile that? Oof, it's it's tough because to to be honest, I'm in a in a very incredibly blessed position that I that I interact with three different markets, three different audiences. 
and three different produce, ways of produce opera. Uh, and so, for example, in, in our gorgeous campus of Santa Fe, I think that actually people have the time. They want to experience the time. They want to spend time in, in, they do tailgating or they go to the club. It's a very, like you book your, your journey to the opera. And a lot of people, they book the, tra the, the travel to the city to, to watch the opera. So I think in, in that case, you mm -hmm. know, I, I definitely find uh, uh, an audience that is going to respond to like the full thing right, in Santa Fe. Uh, in Dallas, we have seen actually really good success when we have done the 90-minute opera range the, the, without intermission, right? Uh, we, we have done very well with those. Uh, so I, I think that, that it's, it's actually, I, I don't think that it's a one-time formula. I think that it requires a very good understanding of the audience that, you, that you're serving. And of course, every artistic specific purpose. But I, I see it depend like in in a metropolitan high city, for example, like Dallas, the shorter, faster, concise, and even sometimes uh, either a, a star driven project or a very like Everest, a very new type of like very recent event in a shorter format will spike sales there. So it's it's a little bit on 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 each side. I would say I would yeah. not generalize it. Yeah. So the future of opera, you know, question mark there about about length and, and format. The the one area, and then, I, and then I have a question for Denise as, as we begin to round the uh, the home stretch here. We didn't really focus on um, the industry's commitment to racial justice, and we have a, a, four panelists whose lives are on stage or producing what is on stage. I, I want to start with David, and as a casting consultant or director or chief artistic officer, how do you think opera can and should achieve greater racial representation on our stages? Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard question because I, 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 I fight it or I have to apply it every day, you know, and uh, and it's not a one, again, it's a side formula, but I, I think that one would be trying to, to create education about where everybody comes, number one, have a lot of conversation about the, the different specialities and the very specificities of, of each performer that educates the, the audience a little bit more and enriches, because not, not a lot of people have consistent content with performers of different ethnicities. And sometimes there's, there's uh, the fear of the unknown, right? So there's a, I, I, I have fight it in different audiences and it's, and it's a, it's a very difficult aspect because there's a lot of lack of training in certain parts, access of higher training and the decision makers are used to the rules of the higher training. And I find it in Munich, in Santa Fe or in Dallas or in other markets that the decision makers sometimes are, are, are trained to expect certain specificities, but I'm, I'm, that, that doesn't mean that the new voice is bad. It's actually very, very, very precious and, and very specific, very unique, but how can we adapt it? One of the biggest solutions, of course, is a power sharing structure. When we bring backup leaders into, into positions of, of, of decision-making or at least in the, in, the, in the conversation, I would also always find ways or I would try to always find ways to, to chat with, with the creative teams that if they're gonna do, for example, a new piece, that is sometimes when we can really start to create a different canon or, or new pieces add onto the canon that are more welcoming in the structure uh, of bringing artistic visions there. And that they, if they're gonna go into Latin American piece or, or like what James is doing at the Met, you know, we, we, he was incredibly gracious too and, 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 and is now in a co-directing situation. So definitely addressing the decision-making part first is, is, a, is the most effective part when you have somebody at the table that is familiar with a multi-ethnicity casting market. You know, it's, uh, I think that for, for me it has really, really been beneficial that I see in every company that I work because I'm a BIPO member and I grew up with Latin American people all the time that by default, there's a little bit of increase in Latin American presence by me. And I see it also the same with, with people of other ethnicities when they are in, in their in position of powers, they suddenly start diverting the wealth of bookings, you know? And, and we create very multicolor, very, very beautiful products. So I, I think that that's 
for me, the key, a little bit of decision making, a uh, path of sharing the power or giving them a little bit the time to, to get into the table and, and discuss it properly. For me, that's the faster path. David, thank you. Jim, as artistic director uh, of an opera company, um, how, and I know Opera Theater St. Louis has a wonderful fellowship program now for BIPOC administrators. I've chatted with the youngsters by Zoom and they're terrific. Uh, they really, they, they will emerge as leaders and they want to really make opera representative of our country in every dimension. They're inspiring. Uh, on stage, how do you, how do you think about your commitment to diversity as you're serving as an artistic director of a company? Well, like I said, I think that if it's, I'm very fortunate that, that Opera Theater of St. Louis has always had a, a, a solid reputation of, of engaging artists of color. And I think that you just have to do it. It's, it seems very normal to, to us at Opera Theater. It's, it's um, you know, we, we keep an eye on it definitely to make sure that, that we're reaching out to as many people as possible um, whom, whom we might want to consider for, for roles or for the Young Artist Program. Um, and now with the fellowship for administrators, uh, that's something that we had been talking about for a long time and we were able to do something about it because of the pandemic. Um, I still believe in the excellence of singing. <laughs> you know, I think uh, that one needs to, to cast people based on their ability to do something. Uh, and, um, you know, but, but we cast people based on their, their potential too. Um, so I think that for opera theater, it, it just feels very normal. I will say though, that, that it takes a little effort sometimes, uh, in the areas that, you know, we don't see on stage directors, assistant directors, conductors, stage managers, all of those people, um, designers even. And that has required a great deal more effort to, to get out there, to give people opportunities, and also to help mentor people, to take a chance, mentor them properly. It's not like I'm going to engage somebody who's fresh out of Yale drama school, who's never done an opera, can't, doesn't like opera, uh, but say that that very promising director of color, uh, I'm not gonna just say, okay, here, direct this very difficult opera. Um, I think that that would be irresponsible. You know, at the, at the Met, the current situation, um, uh, you know, or I shouldn't say situation, the, the, the project that I'm, in, I'm involved with right now, I mean, I'm having an amazing time. And yes, when this, this project rolled around, we were initially supposed to do Fire Shut Up In My Bones in 22, 23. Peter Gelb wanted to move it up to 21. And I said, well, let's do this, let's do this right. So the, um, I'm thrilled that uh, the Met was excited about the idea of me bringing on Camille Brown as co-director. And I think she's somebody who's an extraordinary talent. Um, and you know she wants to direct. She is is starting to direct. But why not? Why not do that? And um, I'm thrilled that that we're doing that. And we have two assistant directors um, who are African American who have never been in the opera house before, and they're learning the ropes. They're interested in it. There are a couple of fellowship positions there. But the way you do it is by example. You know, somebody said, oh, you know, sharing directing credit. And I'm like, why not? You know, I like shared leadership. Um, I've co-directed with people and uh, it, it just seemed very natural to me. But, but you, have to, you have to keep an eye on it and you have to keep, you just have to do it. But also, like I say, do it responsibly. You know, the worst thing that could happen is yeah. giving, giving people an opportunity, say, here, young singer, um, you're uh, Asian, but you've never sung Tosca. Let's just throw you into the deep end, and you know we'll just hope hope it all works out. I mean, I really believe in setting people up for success because nothing can be more damaging than somebody making a, a, an auspiciously lousy debut. 
in something because that's hard to recover from. And that's, I would be a very poor artistic director if I, if I practice that. Mm -hmm. So really you know, working extra hard, mentoring, listening to people, discussing what the right choices are for the company, for the artist mm -hmm. and setting everybody up for success. Uh, uh, some keys to making progress. Um, Denise, I, I've seen you nodding in agreement with some of the things that have been said. Let me, let me turn to you. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge, I saw Anthony had a question earlier. I'm sorry. Uh, and you know, in watching everything on my screen, I've missed that. Um, thanks, Denise. Anthony? Um, I was, I, I can't remember it. Thank you, Denise. And now I can't remember. It was, it was in response to a, a specific point um, that I'm trying to get back to in my head, which I now have lost entirely. <laughs> so when it comes back to you, which it will, take yourself off mute and say, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> just jump right in there. Um, Denise. I just want to say that, you know, my heart bursts in just excitement and enthusiasm. And I just love you all. And David, I know I don't know you, but I love you too. Um, I just, I'm just so grateful for this conversation, how responsible it is, Mark. I know that you've been out there in the trenches the whole time. And Jim, I know from personal experience, from what I've known from working with you, that this is not something that's topical, that this is systemic uh, in terms of, you know, your commitment um, to this. It's just, I, I, I don't know how to express to you how this feels, what this feels like. It just feels amazing to have a seat at the table and to be in the room, um, you know, having the discussion and to be um, considered. You know, I've just been recently given the incredibly daunting task of directing Carmen. I called Jim up screaming. I was like, Jim, help me. But um, I put together this team and I was speaking with Francesca and she said, Denise, you've got all white men. You're gonna have to like fake your own death or like do something. You're like, you, you, you cannot come out like this. But those were the people that I knew. Those were the people that I'd worked with, right? And I only knew them. And I didn't think about it in terms of that. I was just thinking, who do I love? Who do I admire? Who's great? Who I think will, will be patient enough with me that we will work well together. Um, so to Jim's point about it takes effort and that for, you know, it takes effort. And, um, and also to David's point about, you know, the decision-making, it does mean that we have to, stop for a minute and really consider and look at all. And now, now that I'm looking in that direction, I find them everywhere. I see BIPOC people, I say LGBT, I see people everywhere now, right? As soon as you become focused on it and, they, and they're there, the designers, the directors, they're, there, they're all there, right? But we didn't know them before, or maybe the, the, you know, the, we know that the talent is given, but the opportunity is often not. And so that's what we're talking about. So I'm just really proud of everybody here that we're having this discussion. I can't even express what it feels like. You know, um, I felt that, at, um, Jim, when we did our Porgy, um, you know, I'd never done that opera before. But just being in the room with all those different kinds of people, and maybe even more so the piece that we did this summer, the, the, um, maybe even more so the Passion of Mary Caldwell Dawson, because that was done by um, young African-American artists. And, and I was coaching um, the opera, as serendipity would have it, coaching the opera Carmen with them. Um, and it was the first time in my experience, and I've had a long experience with Carmen, that I had a Black Don Jose, a black cow man, a black Michaela. And I just was thinking, wow, look at that. I mean, gee, look at that. That was really quite an experience for me. You know, um, um, I'll tell you this story really quickly. I had done um, Suzuki. I did so many Suzukis. And sometimes, I, you know, this is back in the day when they were doing the Kabuki makeup. I don't think they're doing that anymore. But um, I, so I was painted from head to toe. And sometimes I would just get in the car to go home rather than, you know, take an hour after the show was over to try to wash. But I would forget. Right. So I'd be in the car driving. Right. <laughs> and then I would see the, like people looking at me. And that's what it feels like to be black. That's what it feels like. You're just being yourself, right? You're just being normal and regular. And then it's the response of other people that make you go, what, is something wrong? Like what? So to be able to, to be in this room with you all having this discussion and amongst people who I know sincerely and profoundly care feels amazing. It feels like a new day. Like I think that during the, um, 
pandemic, we were all paused watching all of these pandemics on many levels sort of unfold and, and feeling like, will we really change? Will, will we see this? Because I believe that it, it, you know, what we saw being played out on the streets and across the country in all these different cities is a response to that, is a response to say, I'm here, I exist, I'm in the room, right? That's what all of that was. So, you know, and I may be, my, my students may feel differently and my, my, my children, my own children may feel, they've had a very, very different experience um, growing up. And so their experience won't be like mine, but from the experience that I have had in this body as this personality, um, it feels just amazing, like being seen and welcomed to the yeah. party and yeah. being at the table. So I'm just so grateful to just be talking about it and that we can talk about it without everybody getting weirded out, you know, that we can actually say it. And I know that it's not you. I know it's not Jim. I know it's not David. I know it's not, we're talking about a system yep. that's been in place, right? Yep. And then we can actually honestly and authentically have that conversation. So I'm just grateful for you for even bringing it up. It just, it makes me, well, like, like next time I see you, I'm going to jump all over you, Mark, and just kiss you like crazy and cook you the most fantastic dinner ever. <laughs> no, I'm going to hold you to that. But I just think it's so important that, you know, you know, first of all, who's around the table talking about the production or the work of the company? Who's who's in the decision making role? Who are, who are the decision makers? And then I love the separation of talent and opportunity, because talent is to a certain degree a gift. Talent is nurtured by other talented people, but finally it's the opportunity and all the people who have a chance to give other people an opportunity. So I just I, I love the nuance of this and. Uh, the conversation, of course, has only just begun, and the results of our effort have only just begun to be seen. So more to come, but thank you for that. Anthony? I just wanted to add to what Denise said and, and reminded myself what I was, was saying earlier, which is that, you know, when we go to the opera, it's not so interesting to watch an opera singer on stage. What's interesting is to see a human being express themselves on stage. And in order to do that, we have to be able to tap into our authentic selves, our truth. And I think that what's exciting about this new phase that the pandemic has spurred us into in our industry is instead of worrying so much about being perfect or fitting into a mold or being a part of something, you know, we can figure out what stories, what retellings of traditional pieces tell, can express who we are. And, you know, as a queer person, you know, it's great that we can be open and out and, you know, then also go sing opera. But how do we get to the point of expressing either in the piece we're doing or in the auxiliary materials and engagement that we build around that piece? How do we express who we are? And I think that that ultimately is what brings people into the opera house when they mm -hmm. see the kind of truth being expressed on the stage, like Denise is saying. And, you know, in order for the people making the decisions to, uh, to allow that kind of expression, there's gotta be a lot of listening. And I, like Denise, am so thrilled that there's much more listening happening. Um, yeah. and when we listen, we hear, as Jim is saying, where the real talent is, and we see who the people are. Um, Auntie, I'm gonna stay with you, and then I'm gonna turn to Denise, and it may be the last question we have time for, and it touches on some of the things that have been in the chat. Um, Anthony, you are, you know, in the prime of career, so I don't want to portray you as this, you know, elder of our industry, but certainly at this point, given all the work that you've done and how carefully it's been followed, young singers may come up to you and want advice. Um, what do you give them? What, what do you, what do you give, what advice do you give them about what their career might be like, what helpful hints you may have for their careers. Um, the, wise, the wise Anthony Roth Costanzo, what do you say? The first thing I would say is, you know, find where you can have an impact. And that's something that I think about a lot. Where can I have the most impact and how can I have that? And also uh, think about what really feels passionate to you and how you can express that. But fundamentally, one of the things I tell young singers is that 
the singing itself is incredibly important, but you can really only spend maybe max four hours a day studying this, that, or the other and practicing this, that, or the other. So that leaves you with a lot of other time in your day to be thinking about all of these other things. And I think so often the young singers I meet are fixated on one thing, on getting this aria right or getting their audition set right, but are they cultivating other things which will serve them later, be it their administrative skills? Are they going to a museum? Are they going to a dance performance? Are they think? Are they meeting with their colleagues? Are they talking to someone at a coffee shop and saying, you know, uh, I'm in grad school, but instead of my recital being completely conventional, I want to collaborate with a painter and, you know, have a gallery exhibit. What are you doing to in, in those hours that you're not singing or learning Italian or whatever you're supposed to do? What are you doing to cultivate yourself and that will build out the, the, the art form? Um, and and when, I know when I was at conservatory, a lot of my fellow students, you know, I come from an, uh, an undergraduate university where the exposure to all different disciplines was intense. Then I went to a conservatory and it felt like nobody was thinking about these things. We were all in the library looking at operas. And that to me, that's where we start to get into tricky territory. That's where things start to get less and less interesting. So the, the thing I tend to tell young singers is how are you expanding your field of vision? Great advice for any adults, not, not just singers. Um, Denise, you're, you're teaching young singers at Juilliard at Peabody um, and their career probably won't be like your career. But what, what advice do you give them about how to move forward in this ever more complex world? So thank you for this. And um, uh, Anthony, that was beautiful what you just said. Um, there's an expression that I heard at the beginning of my career and that was if you could, if, if someone could be discouraged, they should be. <laughs> um, what I say to my young People. And, and I am on the other side. I'm in another generation from Anthony. And so I'm in the twilight of, um, of the career. And so um, there's a very, very different perspective now. Um, um, what I say to singers, because they don't know, they don't know when they're at the conservatory. Somebody said to you, you've got a beautiful voice and you've had success, some success with that. You were encouraged. And then you, I, I have one of the one of the most extraordinary women uh, who just graduated. She, she she only came because people said that that's what you sh she should do. It's not that she gave it a whole lot of thought about about what the career is. You know, I started singing because I heard Leontine Price sing, and I was like, oh, I want to do that. What was that voice, and who in the world was that? I didn't know what it meant. So the young people don't have any idea of really what it is that they are seeking. But what I say to the young people is. First of all, you've got to find something that's uniquely who you are. And if, if, if you want to sing, you can sing. There's nothing that prevents you from singing right now, today. You know, if you want to have a career, that's something else. That is something else. If you want to stay in America, if you want to sing opera, if you want to do new music, if you want to do early music, all of those things are choices. But what I say to them is what makes you feel alive? Like what makes you come alive? What do you think that you have that is uniquely you? What moves you? What makes you cry? What makes you angry, right? Look at what don't you like? Look at all of those things. And, and I encourage them to go see and do everything. I say, go to rock concerts, go to heavy metal, do all of that stuff. And then you will, what, what will, what's not you will, you know, fall away. You know, my husband is a rock and roller and, and, and I'm sorry, everybody who, who's out there who I, I'm still in the opera camp. I'm not a huge a rock and roller. And so, and some, um, some, some, some years ago, I did a study for parade magazine where they hooked me up to all these electrodes and stuff and played all these different uh, types of music to find out where music is and what lights up in your brain. And turns out I really do honest to God, like classical music, like I really do. That's what the study showed. Right. But what I say to my students is, Go see everything and what isn't you will fall away. You know, it, every concert is important. Every performance of any kind is important. You can always learn so much from even just a, a novice or somebody who's at the other end. There's, 
there's lessons and uh, to be learned in every single thing in every day. So look at what it, what makes you who you are, look at what turns you on and then see if you can find, you know, and then follow that path, follow that path because, and also look at what you're not good at. Right. Cause that's equally important. And we have to be brutally honest, you know, for if you just look at what excites you and what makes you feel like you are living, right? That's, I think that's the thread that you have to follow. And that can lead you in lots of different directions. And, and you, you know, I, I was, and I think, you know, Anthony was talking about earlier when we're in the conservatory, you're completely myopic, right? You're just like, we're all after this career. We don't even know what it means, but like, we, we're all want to do this thing. And I'd been like, I, nobody, no one could have ever told me that I would be more, um, sort of more invested in somebody else's career more than my own <laughs> until I started studying, until I started teaching, you know, and, and I want for them everything that they want for them. But I, at the same time, you know, that not everybody's going to, you know, make it mm -hmm. right. But, but people can find fulfilling and satisfying lives in other, you know, I, I, I couldn't have imagined that I would be more satisfied and, and happy on the other side of the stage. And I am, and I, and I have been, and I have been totally invested in these young people. They're in my heart and in my lives. And, 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 and they've given me my life. It's the other way around. It's like when you parent, it's like, it's like when you have a child, they actually give birth to you. It's always the other way around. Right. So um, that's what I feel about it, that people should just really look at themselves, look at what, turns them on and find, and they will find, they will find their own way if they are truthful. And if you just have to do this thing, if you will just not stop, then you will. Part of it is staying in the game too. Part of it is just staying in the game and staying healthy and, you know, and just keep getting out there and in front of people if you really want to do that. But there are other ways to feel satisfying and feeling like you, you're making an impact and that you, have something to share with people than just doing it center stage. No, oh, you said so many wonderful things there, Denise. Thank you for that. Now there was one, this last question in the Q and A, I, I wanna do a rapid fire round. We're gonna do a rapid fire round. How has COVID changed the way you will do your art? Has COVID changed the way you're gonna do what you do? Jim? Well, uh, how has it changed? I think part of it is, I mean, so many, so many of the things that we've, we've been discussing, it's like, um, in, in many ways, uh, understanding what audiences have been responding to, um, and what they have not been responding to. And, you know, we have a, a long tradition of doing new works in, uh, at Opera Theater of St. Louis. And, um, and I think that we've learned that the appetite has only grown. People liked hearing and seeing stories about, you know, things that reflect the world around them. And there, and I, I've spent a lot of time uh, finding, trying to locate people, finding people who are interested in embarking on creating new works and just doing more of that. So that has been very enlightening and, and very fulfilling. And I, I also feel in a certain sense, as Denise was talking about teaching, I don't teach, but I am in a position to be a mentor to a lot of people. And I, uh, and I like that role of being a mentor and, and helping to um, uh, foster you know, emerging talent because, um, uh, you know, I felt like I feel like I've got time to do that now, and I have a platform to give yeah. other people a voice. Yeah, uh, and that that has been uh, illuminated, and that uh, that's very meaningful to me. Thanks, David. How how has COVID changed your approach to your work? Oh, the the the, the massive awareness of 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 the world watching now of of everything that 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 we do. You know, like. We have to now not just wing it. I, I, I think that it has pushed to go deep, to understand that every piece that we do, the multi-layers of a, of a booking today are, are, are just, you know, I, I do agree with Jim in the fact that I, I prize the talent as number one, but, but I also have seen now that 
if you know there's a higher talent of 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 in the market, yeah. So then, how do you differentiate one performer a elite in the cover of Opera News to the next one, right? If you, let's say, or the young artist, the two finalists at the Met auditions, both different careers. How how you make the booking and what is your decision making? What is the layer that you're gonna have? Because today we do see that I I personally track a tiny bit, uh, and and for example we did a little bit of experiment in Dallas and and Angel that has an incredible presence of uh, social media uh, and of course you know she's an incredible phenomenal artist she sells the house when she sang Johnny Holiday did it too and when they both play the audience was younger and was way more diverse. So if I have the same amount of visibility and tiers of talent, sometimes I'm going to start checking in several other under layers that are going to happen. And I think that today we have we have the responsibility to think those things when we do a project about how we're going to impact not only the people that are going to come, but also the people that are executing it. So depth, I'm, I'm really taking the time to to really, really take care of every decision has been a consequence. I, it's a slowdown, but a more precise approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slow to go slow to go fast. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Anthony, how has COVID changed the way you're going to do your work, your art? You know, COVID has made me think about the, the root that is common between two words, and that is community and communication. They share the same root. And I think that what we saw within our own industry was everyone banding together as a real community and looking at how to communicate through various lenses and, and digital means, but also then eventually in, in, with live music to other communities. And what I've realized uh, so powerfully in COVID is that the community behind the footlights communicates a message very powerfully. Um, and we need to be able to create that and maintain that. That's very important. And also the community across the footlights is something that needs to be upheld and needs to be constantly creatively engaged. We can't just expect people to come back and listen to whatever story we feel like telling on any given day. So, uh, you know, that, that, those two words are what, what are stuck in my head. Great. Thank you for that. Denise, so, last comment. Uh, Thank you. I would agree with everyone that there's been a deepening of us all during this period of silence and reflection. And, and I think that what we hear from the theaters that have sort of gone back and, and where performances are happening again is that there's an incredible um, appreciation and gratitude for what it is that we do. You know, um, every time I, you know, I, I, I did a performance not so long ago at, at, at Damrush Park and every, all the, everybody was saying, we're just so grateful. We're just so happy to be doing what it is that, you know, it, it is we do. So I think the recognition that what we do is a privilege, first of all, um, and, and it is an honor and, um, and that there is what I feel is just tremendous, tremendous Gratitude to first of all, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure so much of COVID or where I am also in my life, but an appreciation to be able to, to still do it, mm -hmm. to, to do it, and to be able to have that sharing, um, you know, with people on the stage across uh, on, on both sides of the proscenium march and what goes out there too, uh, you know, and we've seen that we've been able to cast a much broader, wider net with all of these different platforms in which we've been able to communicate and share stories. And so um, I would say uh, gratitude. Well, um, that's a word that comes to mind for having these two hours with you. Um, Fred and Angel, uh, thank you for the privilege of uh, this wonderful conversation with such cherished colleagues and friends. Uh, and uh, let me turn it back to you. Thank you, Mark. Well, I uh, personally would like to thank everyone on the on the panel for their participation. I've learned a tremendous amount. I think it's uh, really very enlightening and very heartening. I, I take uh, Denise's quote, it feels like a new day uh, to heart. I think that, you know, it's clear that the opera community is an incredible 
hopefully tight knit creative community. And I think Anthony is right. It's been reaching out through the opportunity of the pandemic to feel how to tie to the wider community at large and helping to redefine its role going forward. And those are obviously critical uh, activities. So I really appreciate all the thoughts everyone has, has contributed. Um, this has been a tremendous webinar. It's exactly the kinds of things we like to share with our members and guests and uh, it broadens everyone's horizon. So again, thank you all for uh, all you have done. Um, I will, uh, be, being sensitive to people's time, I will uh, now wind up the show, if I may. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, on the line. Um, we've had a, a very strong participation throughout the entire two hours, as obviously people were as fascinated as I was. Uh, we will continue to do such programs in the future. And we encourage you to join us, uh, not only for these events and also our in-person events, but also online and, and uh, perhaps even as a member yourself. So again, thank you all uh, for coming. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing this group again in the not too distant future, uh, hopefully in person um, and hopefully on a stage. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody.